Now I'm going to switch onto a related subject. There's a lot of um, one last one for those. Okay. Okay. All these titles I put in red are just to give you a sort of section break. So you know I'm changing subject. Um, okay. We're all generally familiar with the idea of how the tides are formed. That is, the moon acts on the oceans. In fact, there's a tidal bulge on the same side of the moon and on the opposite side of the moon. And because the Earth rotates, the bulges actually get displaced. But the net effect is you generally get two tides a day, although there are some exceptions to that. But the important point, the general concept of the moon raising tides can be applied to a very much larger body getting close to the, to the Earth. If you have very big forces, you can make mountains. And um, mountain ranges span the globe. No one has a good model of how they form. I mean, you can sort of maybe explain some volcanic activity in some small area and say you make a volcano. But to make mountains that cross the whole planet, you've got to have a sort of planet scale phenomena. And um, when mountain ranges appear, they tend to be associated with cataclysmic breaks in the geological record and the fossil record. Um, and in fact, field studies show very strange things. You'll find big slabs of rock that have literally been lifted up and dropped down on top of other bits of rock. And the younger rock is below the older rock. It's hard to explain how that happened. Um, so generally, it seems that there's some very powerful force involved in building uh, mountain ranges. Uh, and this is just a little illustration. I mean, these are the sort of the, the well-known mountain ranges that span the whole planet. And the general idea is rather than, you know, two continents pushing together and pushing up a mountain, something from above is actually pulling the, the, the mountain out of the ground, effectively. And there's a, a real sort of laboratory <laughs> experiment that you can, you can do, which is Io, which is the innermost moon of Jupiter, has an elliptical orbit. And so during its orbit around Jupiter, sometimes it's closer to Jupiter, sometimes further away. So the moon is constantly being squeezed and pulled. And um, it has mountains, it has mountain ranges. And they look very, very similar to Earth mountain ranges. Here's a picture. That was taken by the Galileo spacecraft, and I took that picture over Turkey. And they look very similar. I mean, the actual shape. OK, I'm going to change the subject again. Sorry, I have to, I'm giving you lots of different bits of information. I'm going to put them all together at the end. OK, continents and oceans, oceans and continents. People just accept the fact we have a, oceans and continents, but it's something very strange. It's a very asymmetric planet we have. It's, why do we have these two platforms of rock that are separated by approximately five kilometers? They're different materials. It's very strange. Um, generally, we think of land as only 30% of the whole planet, and that's simply because the continental platforms are actually, some of it is underwater. So in fact, the continental rock is about 50% of the Earth's surface, and the ocean floor rock is about 50% of the, ocean, of the um, planet's surface. But the big question is how? Why did it happen? When did it happen? Um, this is just a nice diagram pulled off the internet, but it, can, it helps you see where the bits of Pangaea are. This is the standard model of Pangaea, which you'll get in any textbook. Um, it's, it's accepted that at the end of the Permian, all the continents are clustered together in some arrangement like this. And that Pangaea is effectively 50% of the Earth's surface. Um, the important thing also to understand is the South Pole is in Botswana, so it's about here. That, that's where it was. We know that from uh, tilites, which is glacial till, which has been formed into rock um, at 250 million years ago. So some ancient glacial deposit. Now, this is the sort of standard plate tectonics idea of Pangaea. So it's sort of a bit of a mess. Um, it's supposed to be just a random clustering. It just happened to occur by chance. Plate tectonics people will tell you that a billion years ago, two billion years ago, continents were moving around the planet. Um, I'm saying that, in fact, there's something very special about Pangaea, the clustering of those continents. OK, the assumptions that plate tectonics theory makes is, as I said just now, Pangaea has no special significance. It just happened that they all collided, all the continents collided into each other and formed some conglomerate continent before breaking up again. 
Um, plate tectonics theory also assumes that continents are moving all the time. It's a continuous process. It's generated from inside the Earth. Um, plate, tecton plate tectonics theory also assumes that continents are actually floating on some mobile layer um, in the outer mantle. And if you read any textbook now, they'll say it's about 8, 10 centimeters a year, the movement. So you should be able to measure it. Um, now we look at the actual evidence. Okay, the idea is that the continents float on this thing called the asthenosphere, which is supposed to be fluid or semi-fluid. But when you look at seismic data, there's no fluid layer. It's all solid. Um, there is actually no evidence of steady widening of oceans. We have lots of electronic equipment now, like um, very long baseline arrays, GPS, lots of measuring systems, and you can't detect consistent movement of continents. You can find lots of wobbles and changes of shape, but you can't find this continuous drift that we think should be happening. Um, there is definitely some evidence that mantle plumes occur, but there's no evidence that mantle plumes are driving continents to move. And in fact, there are very few mantle plumes in the right places. They're not underneath the spreading centers in the middle of the Atlantic, for example. There's one in Iceland, and there's one down somewhere near Africa, and that's it. But this, this whole area, which is supposed to be separating America from Europe, is just inactive. It's not happening now. Um, and the final point is that even though this is often buried in textbooks, if you actually calculate the force necessary to push a whole continent through solid rock, it's enormous. It's much bigger than anything you can get from thermal activity inside the planet. It's a huge, huge amount of force needed to pick up and move a continent. Um, in addition, when you look at the tectonic models, some bits are obvious. You know, this connection is very good. Okay? But this is very strange over here. And in fact, there are a number of errors in the way you can assemble the continents. And in fact, this model here shows you can assemble it in a much more close-packed way. So you end up with a hemisphere rather than a sort of spread out sort of cluster of continental material. And the final point is that there's a very strange story behind this supposed sea called the Tethys Sea, which is a, a sea that separates India from Eurasia. And it's a huge, basically huge ocean because it never existed. There's no evidence for it. Um, I have a suspicion it's something to do with this. Um, okay, if you fly to America and you look at these navigation maps, you'll see this all the time. You can look at what the underfloor, undersea topology looks like. And there's a triangle of rock, of land here, that fits very nicely into here. And it looks remarkably like where Atlantis was supposed to be. And I have a suspicion that at some point, Someone realized that well, we've just assembled all these continental bits and we've just proved Atlantis exists. So I thought, better get rid of that. And so if you twist Europe, you get rid of Atlantis. Okay? Maybe that's not the explanation, but you know, it's it definitely something strange. <laughs> right, so there are two models of Pangaea. There's tectonic Pangaea, which is a sort of open arrangement. And here, this is Tethys Sea here. And there is the new Pangaea model that I assembled here. And you can absolutely assemble the, the continents very, very closely together. It's, and the big breakthrough, and I'll talk about it in more detail, is that I realize that Spain and Sicily fit into Libya really well. And if, you, if that's just like the key to them breaking the puzzle, and you can then start modeling all around that, and you find everything fits together beautifully. Uh, and that's what I just mentioned there. So um, you can see that, and it's not just, you know, just looking at pictures. You can look at geological uh, publications on the type of faults, and you can see that Spain and North Africa have moved relative to each other in a transverse fault. Um, and following on round, you stick Atlantis back in, sorry, it does exist, um, then um, Turkey is pushed up into the Black Sea Basin. Um, the Rift Valley was a very active fault that, in fact, there's a slip of land north-south along the Rift Valley of Africa. And um, basically, you can just assemble everything together. You get rid of the Mediterranean basin, and you end up with a hemisphere. And I'll I'll, I won't dwell too long on these things, but I want to show you a few features. One is this area, the Caribbean, is always a mystery to tectonic people because the underwater, there's basically continental rock. And yet the deep basins there look like impact craters. Um, also, you can see that 
these uh, blue arrows are showing the distance of travel from Pangaea, the new Pangaea model, to present arrangements. It's not very, it's not a huge motion. If you go back to plate tectonics theory, you'll find continents going everywhere, you know, driving all over the planet. So it's, it's a relatively small movement to go from the new, the new Pangaea model to the present arrangement. And I'll illustrate the idea about craters. Basically, Cuba looks remarkably like half a crater. All right? So I went looking on the other side. This is um, Google, Google Earth. In fact, on old charts, this comes up much better. But there's a half a crater off Africa as well. And if you assemble everything together, the craters match up. Okay? Now, this is not a high-speed asteroid impact. There's something different. It seems like huge chunks of rock, earth rock, came in at quite low velocity and smashed into the planet. Okay? Um, okay, so I have the details there. And the fractures from this impact and the related impacts are probably what shattered Pangaea, because it's a big question. Pangaea was supposed to be a supercontinent, very 50 kilometer thick rock. Again, you need a lot of force to break something like that. Um, okay, the, but the critical idea is that the new Pangaea construction is the shape of a bowl. It's, it's, a, it's a hemisphere. And um, they've, the continents do fit together very well. And you can fill in a lot of gaps. I mean, you can look at this model afterwards. But, um, for example, the Arctic Ocean was formed by a chunk of continent actually being moving towards Kamchatka and the sort of eastern end of Siberia. Um, Tethys Sea doesn't exist in this model, don't need it. And that means that India is connected to Asia and all the fossil information shows that's always been the case. Um, so basically you get one continuous hemisphere. And the other thing is the Himalayas are quite interesting because they're basically almost like two bits of continent stacked on top of each other. And in fact, there's geological evidence for that as well. Um, and again, just saying what I was talking about, the Arctic Ocean. So this bit of Siberia moved that way. In these arrows, exactly the travel, distance of travel. And that's how you end up this weird sort of triangular shape in the um, Arctic Ocean. Okay. okay, the other thing that's very interesting about this model is that if you leave Africa more or less in the same place and um, you build the new Pangaea, Botswana was where the South Pole was. And you look on the other side of the globe and you get to Hawaii on the other side. Now, Hawaii is a very strange place. It's a very unstable, geologically active volcanic region. It's got very deep um, fractures into the planet. There's a lot of plume activity. Something very strange about it. And this is probably where the main takeoff point from the moon actually happened. Um, and just this picture just to show, OK, this is new Pangaea model. And again, you can see it's a bit like something went bang. And it's gone that way, all right? And you get to that, which is us. Um, okay, so the big idea is New Pangaea was not a supercontinent. It was half the old crust of our planet. And the other half is missing. But it was never a continent. It was never something with an ocean basin, okay? So what I'm saying is there never was a Permian Pacific ocean basin, all right? Um, at the time of the Permian period, there was one continuous crust made of continental rock. Um, yes, there were oceans, but they were very shallow. And in fact, people never really think too deeply about, yes, you'll find marine fossils on land, but you'll never find marine fossils underwater. And there's got to be an explanation for that. I mean, from that Paleo uh, Paleozoic period. Okay. So where did the crust go? That's the big question. OK, I'm going to just quickly dwell on ocean basins mystery. Nobody knows how you make an ocean basin. No one's come up with a good theory. Um, half the surface of the Earth is made of ocean floor basalt, and it's not very old. It's, only, it's up to 250 million years old. It's between 150 and 250 million years old, the rocks we can find. Um, and th but the land, the granite, is up, well, at least 4 billion years old. I mean, we keep finding older rocks, but that's, there's this huge difference in age. Um, you find Paleozoic marine organisms on land, in, uh, fossilized, but you don't find them on the ocean floor. 
and there's simply no evidence for ocean basins before the, um, in the Mesozoic period. Uh, so basically all ocean basins are strangely young. Um, if you look at the fossils, um, you can't find any fossils that relate to deep water organisms until you get to the Mesozoic, because there wasn't any deep ocean basins. That's basically the explanation for the lack of those fossils. Um, there's a strange thing about the beginning of the Triassic. I'm assuming we're talking geological periods here. So Permian, you have the Great Permian Extinction, then you move on to the Triassic, okay? Okay, so the Triassic is a time when the land was very, very dry, there were no ice sheets, the seawater was twice as saline as today, it's very salty, and, but then over the next 50 million years, the ocean filled up and the seawater got less salty. Where did the water come from? There were no glaciers. Big, big question. We just don't know. And I love this. This is a, in fact, this is a 400 BC vase, which is in a museum in Moscow, which shows some astronomical object pouring water down on Earth. And that was some Greek mythology. I mean, that is, that's not Zeus, so someone else, someone else can help me on that one. Um, okay, new subject again. Destruction of Pangaea. It's, I mentioned it's a great big chunk of the planet. How did it get broken? It takes huge forces to break a continent. Um, and the breaking of the uh, supercontinent, so-called supercontinent, into fragments also coincides with the formation of mountain ranges. You also have this incredible um, flood basalt bleed of liquid magma in Siberia at the same time. These are co coincident events and no one's got a good explanation for this catastrophe. So it appears it's something to do with death from space. Um, there are concentrations of unusual materials. You don't find asteroid impact materials, which are things like iridium and shocked quartz, but you do find uh, a lot of strange um, heavy metals and fullerenes, which are associated with supernova debris. And um, in fact, if you go to Exeter in a museum there, you'll see these big nodules, which actually come from the Permian-Triassic interface, and they contain all sorts of weird things. They're also radioactive. They've got uranium in them, vanadium, all sorts of things. Some fallout happened at the time of this disaster. Um, so the question is, who done it? Um, in addition to these, the fracturing of the continents, the appearance of mountains bleeding out of basalt, something very strange happened to the rock strata. Now this is a standard geological column, so we go down and there's the Permian, so, sorry, this is going from the oldest to the youngest, okay, sorry. So going, there's the Permian, there's the Triassic, and sorry, it's an American illustration, so that would be, we'd call it Carboniferous, this bit here, okay. Uh, it's missing. All right? in, a lot, in most parts of the world, the Permian just doesn't exist. You jump straight from the Carboniferous to the Triassic. The whole, all, the whole strata is just gone. And so what that implies is not only did half the planet get ripped off, but the bit that didn't get ripped off also got shaved. You know? And um, so something very, very powerful was happening. You know? And this is a little illustration of Earth getting torn apart. And coinciding with all that geological drama, uh, suddenly, you know, biological diversity just, boom, stopped. You know, so at the Permian extinction, pretty well everything died. And when people think about it, we say 95% of the species disappeared. But it's more like 99.9999% of all living things disappeared. And just a few survivors got through to then regenerate life on this planet. <laughs> 